This presentation is on examination of the normal and injured elbow. My name is Mary Lloyd Ireland. I'm a professor at the University of Kentucky, Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. This presentation will occur at the ACSM Essentials of Sports Medicine meeting in February 2018 in San Diego, California. This is my website if you would like further information on presentations or publications or links. Now we'll switch to skeletally immature. It's a little difficult to remember and know the appearance and fusion of the growth plates, the apophyses, the epiphyses, physeal plate. So I find it's good to get the opposite side, AP, as a comparison. You can go to pediatric radiology textbooks to determine when the appearance and closure should be. So look for asymmetry is very helpful in these skeletally immature. Girls is shown on the right and boys on the... Sorry. Um, the girl's appearance is shown on the left and boys on the right. So uniqueness of skeletal immature elbow. And when we look at the medial humeral epicondyle here anteriorly, flexor pronator origin is going to start here. The ulnar collateral ligament has some fibers that go into that epiphysis or apophysis, meaning an offshoot, but more of it goes directly into this axilla, into the humerus proximally, and not into the medial humeral epicondyle. When we look medially, you have an open olecranon apophysis in the skeletally immature. So this would sometime lead to an Osgood Schlatter's of the elbow, if you will, where the triceps is pulling. They can have an apophyseal injury of the olecranon. You also have the ulnar collateral ligament. And as I mentioned, the medial epicondyle is here with the uh, flexor pronator origin. And deep is where the ulnar collateral ligament connects, not onto the medial humeral epicondyle. Little Leaguer's elbow is more of an epicondyle problem. A thrower or pitcher elbow to the UCL is more common in the older individual, closer to skeletal maturity. In the skeletally immature elbow, anteriorly, acutely, physeal humerus fracture, capsular sprain, hyperextended elbow, Chronically, loose bodies can ping and move around the elbow and cause locking. Medial is where the action is. Medial humeral epicondyle fracture. It's more rare to have a UCL injury in an immature individual, but with more and more throwing and lack of taking rest and showcases and other things, we are seeing UCL injuries earlier and earlier in our 14-year-old male thrower. You can have ulnar nerve subluxation or fracture, chronic. Medial humeral epicondyle overgrowth occurs with repetitive throwing from a young age. This is little leaguer's elbow, and you can definitely see an asymmetry of the medial humeral epicondyle in the dominant throwing side compared to the opposite side. You can also have stress reaction and nerve instability of the ulnar nerve. Posteriorly, think about that olecranon fracture, olecranon bursitis. You can't have a contusion. The olecranon fracture would be an apophyseal injury where the triceps tugs on that open plate and then you have a stress fracture of the olecranon. Chronically, olecranon traction, apophysitis, spurs, loose bodies, posterior medial spurs, which are seen more commonly in throwers. What about lateral? Acutely, that compression side, get an OCD of the capitellum, osteochondral fracture of the capitellum. Lateral humeral epicondyle fractures are not that common. Sometimes we'll see that with a, with a dislocation of the elbow, as in a gymnast. Anterior subluxation of the radial head, which we see in nursemaids or curbstone elbow in the younger individuals, the two-year-olds, fracture of the capitellum. Chronically, lateral humeral epicondylitis. You can have radial head overgrowth if you have an OCD, loose bodies. And you can see osteochondritis of the radial head, but that's unusual. This is a 14-year-old avid baseball pitcher. He had pain in his left elbow for two months. He couldn't straighten his elbow out. 
His diagnosis is OCD of the capitellum, which is chronic. Oftentimes these individuals come and say, yeah, I could straighten my elbow out until recently, but typically these are more chronic. So a thing that I like to do with pitchers is to have them be checked for their active passive range of motion of the elbow, which should be symmetrical. This is his pre-op x-ray. You can see here where his medial epicondyle, this is his apophysis here. So this looks normal. Radial head looks normal. But see, this is why we get oblique views. It's a little hard to see on the lateral view or this. But you can see here with a little bit more external rotation, we get a little bit more irregularity of the capitellum. No radial head overgrowth. Flexion extension view. So this documents his degree of flexion and extension. So he had significant limitations. You can see, not see the OCD very well on these films at all, but you can see it again on this oblique view. MRI scans do help us in this. You can see where there's fluid in that capitellar fragment, and usually these patients come in when the fragment is already almost loose or there are some loose pieces, so we get concerned of whether or not we can fix this, and usually we cannot fix it. Uh, MRI scan, the sagittal views below and coronal views up above. This was a non-injected joint, so he did have fluid in the joint. And the concern, as you can see on these sagittal views, is there's a split there. So the capitellum is in several small little pieces, and there's very little bone that is there, so it's unlikely it can be fixed. This is the arthroscopic view. Um, this is his radial head is up above, radial head is here. So this is the bed of the capitellum and all these pieces were loose and you can see the bone quality isn't very good and there's not any bone of significance on the pieces. So unfortunately we have to take this out and then we do a microfracture to allow for better healing of that capitellar bed. This shows it after I've debrided it. You can see the synovitis here where that's really thick and an unhappy radial head, synovium. So this is after we've done a debridement, and then hopefully this will fill in with some tissue that's better than the OCD lesion that was loose and causing him symptoms. It's the end of his pitching career, however. This is what the loose bodies looked like. Um, there was very little bone on these fragments, and these fragments were already in pieces when the uh, surgery was performed. So not very big pieces, but for a skeletally immature capitellum, it is a pretty significant injury. This is his picture of the biggest piece. And then follow up two years later, you can see where the there still is abnormality, but fortunately we got to this one relatively quickly, and sometimes you'll see hypertrophy or overgrowth of the radial head, and in this case you don't see that, but you don't see a normal capitellum. His medial epicondyle is now fused. This is a 15-year-old football athlete who was getting up from the ground. Somebody fell on his distal humerus and he sustained a posterior elbow dislocation. This is what it looks like in the emergency room. So we've got our thumb in his olecranon fossa and the, the dislocation is posterior. This is what the x-rays look like from the front. You can't quite tell what's where. The lateral view shows you that the proximal ulna is posterior, so a posterior elbow dislocation. We can't really well see where the piece is here, so his medial epicondyle has been pulled off. Sometimes this can be obscured in the joint and cause a lack of ability to reduce this. This is when he's still got his pads on. We gave him a little IV sedation to get his pads off. So this is what a posterior elbow dislocation looks like. Do IV sedation and reduce this. Since it is a hinge joint, it is a little harder to get back in, and I think it's good to get x-rays prior to the reduction attempt. So this is reducing him where he's on his back. I'm applying traction toward the bed, and the assistant is pulling on the proximal humerus. Axial traction is never a bad thing, so just doing traction, pulling, pulling, reducing him. And then you can see the amount of swelling that he has now. Then we do an exam. Ulnar nerve was functioning before reduction and after reduction. This is at the time of his open reduction internal fixation of his medial epicondyle. The humerus is to the right. We're putting the screw in in the medial epicondyle. The ulnar nerve is posterior. And this is what the post-reduction looks like. So this is after we've fixed his medial epicondyle where his flexor pronator originate. He did very well postoperatively. 
This is the pre-op film. So in this film, you can't see that medial epicondyle that is like right here, but see how you can't see where it is. So always get post-reduction films. The post-reduction film shows us this. So this is his pulled off displaced medial epicondyle because the flexor pronator is still connected to it. So this needs to be fixed. We just repaired his capsule, didn't really do anything with his ulnar collateral ligament, started moving him early because these will get very stiff. So that's the fragment that you want to see, get post-reduction films always. And then this is a summation of what we did at the time of surgery. Here's his ulnar nerve. This is as that fragment is already put back, and then we just repaired his capsule, and he went on to do very well. How do you reduce a posterior elbow dislocation? It is easier for me to do it in a prone position, so the bed helps you, and then you can use all the force that you need to, pull, to provide axial traction, pull straight down, and then go into extension, and then you should be able to reduce it with IV sedation in the emergency room. So the bed really helps you out. Gloves help. Uh, considerable force is, is, a, is required sometime because it is a hinge joint and you have to uh, get that back over the lip of the proximal elbow, proximal humerus. So pull down, use gloves, and make sure the patient is sedated. X-rays before and x-rays after. Medial aspect of the elbow. This is the sublime tubercle of the proximal elbow. It's where the ulnar collateral ligament anterior bundle attaches. So in skeletal immature, sometimes you can have a fracture of that. That may heal with immobilization, but you definitely don't want to allow the athlete to throw with a sublime medial proximal ulna fracture. Sometimes these do need to be fixed. This case is a 12-year-old who's had medial elbow pain for four months. Oftentimes the pitcher is the quarterback. So if you look at the x-ray on the left, this is Little Leaguer's elbow that Adams described in 1964. Medial epicondyle, the origin of the flexor pronator is here. So that force also with the physeal injury allows for the displacement here. Ulnar collateral ligament is typically normal in these um, individuals because they're less mature and so they injure here with those tensile forces as opposed to tearing their ulnar collateral ligament. Immobilization was not done. He was not allowed to throw. He used a sling if he was tempted to do something and at one month this healed. So these will usually heal. This is at three months. So it looks like when you look at this, we may need to fix it, but his was displaced directly out, not displaced or rotated distally, so he did heal. But we got to appreciate this, so sometime you have to get the opposite side. So here's his opposite side right here. So you can see a big difference there, and this helps explain to parents why we're, we're going to do suggest the treatment that we do of not throwing for at least a couple months, if not four months. medial humeral epicondyle, little leaguer's elbow on the left, and his normal one on the right. This is a almost 13-year-old male pitcher, little leaguer. He's now in the All-Stars, three-week history of medial elbow pain. He's a big, uh, big dude. He doesn't really have any instability. He hurts. He's been at a growth phase. So here is his elbow x-ray, different than that last one I showed, a little older individual, but see this little fracture right here? You want to pick up on that as well. So this is his normal side. This is his dominant side, injured side. So his apophysis looks pretty good. The medial epicondyle, this space looks pretty good. So he's mature enough now where he has an ulnar collateral ligament injury at the attachment or the attachment up here on the uh, axilla area of that medial uh, distal humerus. And we immobilized him. So here's his follow-up at six weeks. So his ulnar collateral ligament with his pull-off in that area, that went ahead and healed because we stopped him from pitching. So this is at four months. If we get that BB appearance to the medial epicondyle and you have a fracture, it may heal if you don't allow them to pitch too early. It may take time to heal, but you can do an MRI scan to document that the UCL is intact. Back them down. Don't let them throw. 
So this is that BB. Don't allow them to fire that gun too soon. Don't allow them to throw too soon. And if you get this diagnosed early in an individual like I showed, then hopefully he won't have to have a UCL reconstruction. This is one that wasn't so lucky, a 14-year-old, another pitcher who um, has an open medial humeral epiphysis, but look at his avulsion. So um, his fracture was displaced, ulnar collateral ligament was unstable, and so he had a reconstruction performed, baseball career ended. What are the risk factors with these young pitchers? Overuse, fatigue, high pitch velocity, Dr. Andrews is quoted as the speed gun is the worst invention in the history of Little League Baseball. Everybody wants to throw faster. Showcase participation is a risk factor. Age group, when we look at these, looking at 95 pitchers who had surgery, 45 adolescents no surgery, these were the analyses that caused an increased risk in pitching. Arm fatigue, 36 times greater risk. Greater than 85 miles an hour, 2.6. Greater than 80 pitches a game, fourfold. Greater than eight months a year of pitching and baseball play, fivefold. So this is what we need to address and save our young pitchers' elbows. So this big pitcher syndrome, this 13-year-old, skeletally and mentally immature, fast growth phase, poor pitching mechanics, they also will have hip weakness, um, and that leads to upper extremity overuse injury. We healthcare providers sometimes have to be the parents and the voice of reason. We've got to protect our young athletes. We must work to reduce the rate of rotator cuff, shoulder problems, and UCL injuries in young pitchers. Little league pitchers do not become big league pitchers. This is something to talk to parents, coaches about. So let him play multiple positions. Nolan Ryan didn't start pitching until he was a junior in high school. There are some resources that we can use. This is multiple organizations endorse this. It's stopsportsinjury.org, and it spans, stands for Sports Trauma and Overuse Prevention. There are 18 different sports on this site. And I think that our youth can go to this site and maybe even diagnose some of their elbow problems and make their patient, make their parents bring them in to be patients. So this is an awareness site and one that I think is very good for you to use in your practices. You can give them flyers out or make sure they know where these are and the patients and family and coaches can go to this site. This is a former high school pitcher he has elbow pain when he threw, but he kept throwing. Now he's got loss of supination. His range of motion is significantly less, so he can't supinate his dominant right forearm. He's lost range of motion. He's like 40 to 110, and not only can he not play baseball anymore, he can't do anything much repetitive with his right dominant extremity. So this is what his x-ray looks like. He's got severe arthritis, so this is spurring in the front. This is where he's got arthritis. He probably had an old osteochondritis the seconds lesion of the capitellum. Capitellum overgrew or undergrew, and the radial head had hypertrophy or overgrowth. And look at the severe osteoarthritis he ends up with. So don't let our pitchers throw through pain or throw through limited range of motion. In conclusion, if you understand anatomy, mechanism injury, and biomechanics of the sport, elbow examination will lead you to the correct diagnosis. You can see swelling in elbows. Everybody is going to try to stay in the game. So in an adult, we can say, hey, it's your elbow. But we must protect our young athletes. We must also know the uniqueness of skeletally immature elbow, protect the young elbow, and we, the health care providers, often become the parent and should intervene. Kids don't know fear. They don't know pain, so they want to keep on throwing, and they will throw through injuries. Thank you very much for your attention. My website is myname.com. Look up other presentations or information on this website.